Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us from this present evil world according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That portion of God's word which we consider this morning, the Holy Spirit has caused the Apostle Paul to write to the Ephesians 2,000 years ago for our benefit and learning. Put off your old man, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Let us pray. God, let not love of sinning thy fear drive from my breast, lest Satan triumph winning be of my heart possessed. Lord, let thy chastening rod each day give me direction to seek thy sure protection and tell thy grace abroad. Amen. <clears throat> when God led the children of Israel into the promised land, it wasn't a peaceful affair. There was war. The children of Israel killed the Canaanites and took their land that God had promised to them. They fought, and the land was theirs. But even after they possessed the land and built cities and lived in it, there were still Canaanites remaining there. The Jebusites still harassed the children of Israel, and so they still had to fight. And the fight continued as long as they lived in that land. The fight at the beginning, when they conquered the land, was the same as the fight that they had to continue as long as there were Canaanites still living there. When you come to faith, there is a battle. The old Adam is drowned and dies when you receive the forgiveness of sins through faith in your baptism. You are born again and you become a new creation with new thoughts and new desires so that you come to hate sin and desire to do good. And all these things, the Holy Spirit works in you when he brings you to faith in Christ. He does this all by grace that is freely apart from your works. And yet, even though you are a Christian, the battle continues. Just as the children of Israel inherited the land and yet had to keep fighting against the remaining Canaanites, so you are saints now, holy now, through faith in Christ Jesus, but you fight against the remaining sin that is in you. This is the common Lutheran expression, same time sinner and saint. The fight, and this is interesting, the fight that happens in the beginning of your faith against the unbelief in you is the same fight that continues as long as there is sin in you. And that will be until the day that you die. This sin that you fight against is personified in what the scriptures call the old man or the old Adam. The Bible also calls the old man the, the, the flesh. It is our evil, old, sinful nature that behaves like the Canaanites did in the Old Testament in the Promised Land. All the laws that God gave to Moses were specifically geared against the horrible behaviors of the Canaanites. And all of these horrible behaviors come down basically to their unbelief. What is our old Adam like, this unbeliever? He doesn't fear God but he wants to engage in sin without a thought of God's judgment coming upon him. And our old Adam doesn't love God or desire God as much as he loves himself or whatever pleases him. That's just his behavior. And our old Adam doesn't trust in God, but rather he trusts in what he sees and what he feels and what he experiences. And this general unbelief, this lack of fear, love, and trust in God, it results in all the sins that the Bible says are the works of the flesh. That is, works that come out of this unbelief of your old Adam. And he lists a bunch, in, uh, Paul lists a bunch in Galatians chapter 5. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, abortion, hatred, fighting, jealousies, outbursts of wrath or outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, that is, doing things only for yourself dissensions, that is, people being divided out of personal animosity, heresies, that is, false doctrines, 
envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. That's, that's uh, too much partying, basically. Revelries, often translated orgies, and the like. And the Bible says that those who, quote, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why is this? Well, when the old man gains the upper hand in this battle between the spirit and the flesh, what does he do? Well, what is his goal? But to extinguish faith in Christ. So that these works of his become dominant in a Christian's life. So the person then who stops fighting against the works of the flesh and against his old man's desires, that person ceases to be a Christian. He loses his faith. He has given the promised land back to the Canaanites so that he can act like a Canaanite and give up the fight against sin because it's just plain easier to go along with the crowd and walk on that broad way that leads to destruction. And this is why St. Paul's admonition to us today must always be impressed upon us. None of us may think, hey, we're Christians. It doesn't matter how much we sin. And I don't need to worry about sin because Jesus took care of it. So I'll just go on living my life the way it was and just be glad that in the end I get a get out of jail free card. This is the opposite, the opposite of what the forgiveness of sins does to a person when someone believes it. When Jesus told the man with palsy to stand up and walk, the man with palsy didn't stay on the ground. He got up and he walked. So when Jesus forgives us our sins, we don't say, hey, great, I'll just keep these sins and the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't work that way. The forgiveness of sins is antithetical to sin. It frees you from it. It makes us righteous before God. And the forgiveness of sin wins the battle against sin for us. And this forgiveness of sins is given to us without our works. When it is given to us, it changes who we are. We don't change who we are. God does. And he does it by bringing us into the promised land as the children of Israel. And hearing the gospel then not only gives us a new identity as God's children, but as our new identity comes, it also renews our minds. It gives us an entirely different perspective on God and the world and sin and who we are. When we learn who God is in the forgiveness of sins, we begin to understand who we are. This is why Paul says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which was created after God in true righteousness and holiness. To be renewed in the spirit of your mind is to receive what makes you into a new creature. As the scripture says, whoever is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this new creation, again, is not something that you can create. God creates you new. And this is by grace. There's a, can I give you a a boring theological term? Is that okay? Some, okay, thank you. It's called divine monergism. Now, divine means according to God. Mono means one. And urgism means work. Like energy means work inside something, right? So divine monergism means God alone working. God alone brings you to faith. God alone creates you. In the beginning, he said, let there be light. There was light. He made man without any cooperation of his. And God makes you into a new creature without you doing a single thing thing. And he does this by restoring to you what Adam lost in the Garden of Eden, which is that righteousness and holiness that we all lack. And so he does this by forgiving you your sins. He never does away with your sins with your help. You never get rid of your sins. Only Jesus can and does this with his word. Because what was gained on the cross was gained once and for all. But the fact that it was gained on the cross means that it now needs to be given to you. So it is gained by Christ once on the cross, one sacrifice for all, and now it is given to you often and in many ways through his word. That's why his word is so precious. His word gives you what his death gained for you. Jesus gained the forgiveness of sins at eternal life on the cross by dying for sins. And the gospel is the good news that Christ, by his sacrifice on the cross, as the Lamb of God, as we sing every Sunday, has taken away the sins of the world. And this means that God is reconciled to you and that God loves you. 
and you find the love of God in this gospel. This gospel then, when, you, when, he, when this is preached to you, it creates a faith in you that didn't exist before, a faith that believes the gospel. As the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You begin to think of God in an entirely different way. You no longer fear him or look at him as a malevolent judge who is out to get you. You're no longer confused by what might be his will for you in your life. You look at him that he who spared not only his only son but gave him up for us all, how shall he not freely with him give us all things? And everything changes. You are a new creation. And yet, there is still that old creation as a part of you. The battle in the beginning and to the end is the same. And it is believing this gospel, this forgiveness of sins through Christ in the face of all of our sins and temptations. Now the root of all sins, as I have often said and the Bible clearly teaches, the root of all sins is unbelief. And what the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, our old man, don't want you to do is believe the gospel. Because that stifles everything. That stifles the new creation, it stifles new thoughts, new desires, good works, and it takes you to heaven. And the devil doesn't want you to go to heaven. And your flesh wants to stay on earth and thinks that his only life is here on earth. And the world wants to exalt herself in this life. So when you believe the gospel, though, sin is removed from your conscience, you are saved from living a futile life here on earth. You are rescued from the devil's bondage and your mind is renewed and you begin to see God as your friend and you see again the devil and the world and the, your flesh for who they are, your enemies, who are going to try to seduce your flesh into more and more unbelief and resentment against God. This battle continues. And so the question is, since the Bible says put off the old man, how do you put off the old man? Well, you believe the gospel. It really is that simple. It's simple, but it's very painful because God works it in you and he tears away from you things that you like. He shows you your sins and you repent of them and then you need again and again that same forgiveness. How could it be so often that we need it? How could it be? But the gospel alone gives you Christ's victory over sin. You just can't win a single battle by your own powers. A Christian learns that. That is the mind of Christ. Adam and Eve never thought that they could do it on their own until they ate of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. You can only defeat sin through faith in Christ. When you believe that your sins are forgiven, God gives you desires and thoughts then that oppose sin, that resist sin. He moves your heart then to pray to God in time of need and not just throw up a Hail Mary, but actually to believe that he is hearing your prayer and that he actually wants to help you and he will help you in every temptation. God gives you that desire and that faith when you come to faith in Christ. And when you believe that your sins are forgiven, God then also gives you the desire to forgive your enemies and to do good to those who have done you evil and to stifle in that anger so that you don't make it go into sin and then to show love and stop stealing and to show generosity freely. Whereas before, when you did good things, it was basically because hey, I want to feel better about myself or I want to feel good about myself and maybe this is the right thing and this would be good for me. But it was never freely and spontaneously as the gospel makes faith do. Now, if you want to see a really good example of the, old, of the new man at work, then you can look and read the Bible in the Old Testament. You see countless examples of this. I'm going to today choose two examples, Joseph and David. Uh, Joseph, the story of Joseph was my favorite story when I was a kid. Well, besides David, because David and Goliath is awesome, and every young boy likes David and Goliath. But, but Joseph, the story of Joseph is just wonderful, how he gets sold into slavery by his brothers, right? And then he gets put into Potiphar's house, and because God is with him, he ascends to become the steward of, of the entire household. But then Potiphar's wife casts her eyes on him and desires him, and then she, and then she tries to seduce him. Well, the new man is always putting off the old man whenever he starts seeing him getting angry or lusting or being greedy. And when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, if you'll remember, he said, how can I sin against God? But she wouldn't listen to him. And she grabbed a hold of his cloak and he left it there. He left that old cloak with her and ran away half naked. He put off the old man 
and his works by not caring about what he lost. But he didn't just lose his cloak because Potiphar's wife then lied and accused him of attempted rape. And he was thrown into prison by Potiphar, who believed his wife's lies. Now the Christian, by trusting in Christ, leaves his old cloak behind him with the sins that would allure him, just as Potiphar's wife tried to allure Joseph. And you know what happens when a Christian leaves behind his old cloak? He suffers for it, just as Joseph did. But look at how God prospered Joseph's way, so that even when he was thrown into prison, he was taken care of, and he eventually he became the head of the prison. And then he helped out two people. Well, he actually helped out one, the, the, the butler, or the wine, the wine pour, the cup bearer. And he was lifted up to save Egypt and his family as the ruler of all Egypt. So that even though for a long time it seemed as if his abandoning this cloak was a bad thing for him, yet God brought it out for good. God teaches us. He will keep us when we leave behind our old man. He will not only take care of us, but he will lead us to rule over our enemies, sin, death, and the devil. Why? Because Jesus is even now seated at the right hand of the Father, with all things being subject to him under his feet. And there's another story, the other example of putting on, now this is, Joseph's an example of putting off the old man. David is an example of putting on the new man. And this, his example shows that the Christian life isn't all gloom and doom and depression when we put off the old man. Because when you put off the old man, you also put on the new man. David, when he was bringing the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem, if you'll remember, the Ark of the Lord is the central piece of worship in the Old Testament. In the tabernacle or temple, there was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place. You only went into the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement, where blood was brought and sprinkled on the mercy seat, which was on the Ark of the Covenant. And this blood pointed people ahead to the forgiveness of sins that Christ would win on the cross by sprinkling his blood. So when they have the Ark there, that's the forgiveness of sins for them. That is what reminds them of the gospel and of the coming Christ. And, they, and David, when he brought this orc, uh, ark into Jerusalem, he took off all of his war garments and all of his fighting. And he put on the clothing of a priest, which was an interesting thing to do. Only priests did that. He wore a thin linen ephod, what was, it was called. And he wore this ephod. And as he wore this garment, he danced with all his heart before the Lord. He rejoiced in the presence of God and the ark of the Lord because he knew that this meant his sins were forgiven. So when we put on, put off the old man, we also leave behind all that violence and futility of the old man and all his works and ways. And we are clothed then with a future because the righteousness of Christ endures forever. We are clothed with Jesus' righteousness. And God makes us his priests so that we wear this ephod of Christ's righteousness, and we offer up sacrifices of praise and happiness, and we can dance through life knowing in every circumstance, no matter what God lays upon us, that he is with us, that no sin can harm us as long as we belong to Christ and trust in what he has done. The life of the old man is our old life, and you see it in you every day. You just can't get away from it. Different people call it different things. Johnny Cash has a song called The Beast in Me. Anybody ever heard that? Beast in Me. Sometimes he tries to kid me that he's just a teddy bear. That's what the old man is going to try to do to you. But don't be discouraged when you see that your sins are so strong. When you see, even against your loved ones, anger and greed and lust and envy in your life, this is what you can expect from your Canaanite old man. Israel feared the Canaanites too, but they were wrong too. Fear God instead. Trust in him alone. He alone can help you. And he has promised you complete victory in Christ. And this victory isn't found in your strong exertions against bad habits or in anything good that you do. This victory is found in what alone conquers your sin, what alone silences the accusations of the devil, what alone makes the world unable to harm you, though you lose everything that your eye holds dear. Your victory, and thus your life and your future and your happiness, are all in Jesus, who has authority on earth to forgive sins as he proved in our gospel lesson.
He can say to the man with palsy, rise, take up your bed and walk. And his word does what it says. Just as he commanded and it was done, so now he commands your sins to depart. And when he says you, to you, when he says to you, I forgive you all your sins through a sinful man, he does it and he means it. And he says also, do not trouble my Christians. I paid a dear price for them. It was my own precious and innocent blood. And in that blood is the ransom that death and sin and all the despair on earth must submit to. This means that your guilty conscience is no match for the body and blood of Jesus. Your sins, though you have seen them increase in your life, they still can't be more than the sin of the whole world that was placed on Jesus and his blood atoned for. See, when you come to know God and the forgiveness of sins, you come to know who he really is. He is your loving father. So draw near to him as he is to you. The way he thinks about you is how you come to think about him. He is your dear father and you are his dear children. And we are the family of God. As the epistle lesson said, we are members one of another. We are one body. We have an identity that was given to us in our baptism. And this means that God is going to teach us to act like his children. And he's not going to do so harshly and in wrath and in anger. He's going to teach us to be his children with love. He'll discipline us, but he'll do it in patience and mercy. He will forgive us as often as we come to hear him, to hear that precious gospel that defeats our enemies, the devil, the world, and our old man. And when he removes the old man from you by forgiving you your sins, he will clothe you again so that you can say these beautiful words of the prophet Isaiah with a clear conscience. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. God grant this to us all for Jesus' sake. Amen.